Hi everyone, welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. I am Matt Connerton, and with me as always, the Honorable Gary S. Hopper. Or the, oh, you've got your... I got my ass back. You've got, yeah, you got your I got ass my back. ass back. That's good, that's good. Yeah. How are you doing? Welcome, and uh, I don't know why I'm welcome. I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm welcome just, is I, weird. I'm, 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 <laughs> I don't know why I said welcome. <laughs> You're here every week. <laughs> I don't know why you said that either, man. I don't know. Well, welcome, Gary. Welcome to the show. You're Irish, right? I am, yes. Yeah, so maybe she's just getting too close to St. Patty's Day and you're getting maybe. a little... I'm weird, though, because, like, I'm, I'm Irish, but I, well, I... Wait, wait, wait. That's two separate statements. Well, I know, but... but okay, go ahead. I, I, I hate corned beef and cabbage. I think corned beef is disgusting. I'm what? Not, I do. I think, oh, I think it's awful. It's like... No, wait, wait, wait. Are you... The, the, the I, texture of it. It's like meat that's already been chewed. Ugh. Now, wait, wait. You, you, you really sure you're Irish? I am. I am. Okay. I, I hate corned beef and cabbage. I, I'm not much of a drinker. I don't have much of a temper. I don't know. But, but I'm Irish. It's, it's strange. And I don't have red hair. Oh, our guest is you here. you have freckles? I did when I was a kid. Yeah? But they went away. Yeah. They went away? Yeah. Okay. If you say you're Irish, I'll take your word I'm for it. I'm still pale, though. I'm kind of pale. Yeah, I've been impaled on things myself. Oh, my. Well, yeah. that's no fun. Yeah, no, it's not good. I think I wrote on myself. <laughs> Today, tonight, we have a special honorable guest. Yes. Representative Mike McCarthy there. How are you doing, Representative? Oh, pretty good. I figured you'd have me on just for the St. Patrick's Day thing. That's right? it. That's exactly. it. Exactly. Do you like corned beef? Top no. Thank you. Beef stew's fantastic. You though. don't like corned okay, beef. So I do See, I'm not the only one. Because I, I hate corned beef. Because I'm questioning his, his, the, his Irishness because of his lack of... Uh, but a fellow Affinity Irishman for corned beef. Doesn't, doesn't like corned beef? Now, I put more emphasis on uh, being funny than corned beef. Mm. See, if you're not funny, you can't be Irish. So we'll throw you out. Oh, if you don't have a sense of humor, you can't be Irish. No. I, I agree with that. I have it's never, one of the keys. Yeah. It's stringy, or right? White, it's, or, it's the texture of the corned beef. It's like, it's, it's like oh. meat that's already been chewed, right? I, I thought you were you talking agree? about someone's sense of humor. Uh, no. Yeah, no, Gary's I, sense I of know. humor <laughs> is stringy. It's yes. stringy. It's already uh, been chewed. Yes, yes. 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 <laughs> Retread jokes. Uh, yeah, no, I never really cared for corned beef and, yeah. and cabbage. But beef stew's fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife makes a fantastic one. She puts cayenne pepper in it, so it yeah. spikes it up a pretty good. good. Well, if you put cayenne pepper, it's not Irish anymore. Uh, it's American. <laughs> well, okay. So anyway, so so in in lieu of St. Patty's Day, there's so there's an Irishman. He goes into the pub. Oh boy. <laughs> this is this is if uh, this is not politically correct. So if there's viewers that are easily offended, shut the TV off for 20 seconds. Your they, they should Your know by now. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, so Irishman goes into the pub, and he uh, he's 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 sitting there for a while, and he says he thinks to himself, "Oh, I get to get home. My wife's gonna my wife's gonna kill me." And so you know it's it's uh, getting late, and he knows he's gonna get in trouble. So he stands up and he goes. Bam! Right in the face first, right in the on the ground, you know. He says, "Wow, I didn't think I drank that much." So he, he crawls he crawls out to the front stoop of the pub, and he's sitting out there in the fresh air for a little while. And he he says, "All right, all right, I gotta get home. My wife's gonna kill me." He stands up, smack right down on the pavement, you know. He says, "Oh, geez, I didn't think I drank that much." So he he crawls all the way to his apartment, up the stairs, crawls into bed, and passes out. And his wife nudges him in the morning and says, Patty, Patty, I've been drinking again. He goes, oh, no, dear, what makes you say that? He says, oh, the pub just called. You left your wheelchair down there again. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty that. good. I love no, that one. What? <laughs> I said, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. It oh. is. It is. You're yeah. not going to humor him? What kind of politician are you? Oh, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, I gave that up a long time ago. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Usually you're funny, but right now you're the only one really laughing. No, 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 Mike, I'm not. Oh, my goodness. In my head, I'm, there's lots of people laughing. Good. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sir Mike. Yes, sir. What, uh, did, what did you see happen today that you would like to speak about as far as in the legislature? We did uh, a few abortion bills. Yes. That went over actually pretty well. I don't know which ones were quite veto-proof. Let's see. Um, uh, the you know that we discussed on the show a while back whether or not a woman should have, uh, especially young the younger women have the opportunity to understand what the ramifications of abortion are. Yes. Basically yes. Basically informed uh, consent. Right. Post abortive and stress. 
that that passed today. I don't know uh, uh, whether that was uh, veto proof or not. Because typically, like this, if it's pro-abortion, the Democratic governor will veto it. It doesn't matter the merit or the non-merit; he's going to veto it. Mm -hmm. It's just he might. Well, he is, he's not running for re-election, so maybe he won't. Mm. But if he's going to vote with his base, quote unquote, right. he, he will veto it. I don't know if we get the votes to override that. Well, the difficulty we're having today um, that we we didn't have a lot of people that were there. I think we only have 306 people or so at one point out of 400. Yeah. So the real issue will be when it comes to veto overrides as to how the people who weren't there today would have voted and how they'll vote again later. Okay. You know? So it's just a matter of kind of gauging the mood of those people. Right. But uh, yeah, we we had a pretty good uh, pretty good showing on those issues. Yeah, we did. Um, let's see. Well, it's a partial birth abortion that passed. That's a kind of a funny one because uh, partial birth abortion are abortions in the f what trimester? The third well, the trimester. Third, third yeah. trimester. Mm -hmm. Basically, the child's already developed and w it could survive outside the the womb. Mm -hmm. And they say they don't do any in New Hampshire. It was kind of weird if you listen to the debate because they said they don't do any in New Hampshire. And besides with the, which there's already a federal law against it. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. if somebody needs one in New Hampshire, they send them to New York or Boston. But you've got to be a lawyer to understand the logic there because either it's illegal or it's not illegal. Yeah. But somebody clarified it, and if I, uh, uh, I think uh, Representative Notter clarified that, that it's a federal law, but it's only a federal law if the state has a corresponding law to support it. Really? Something like that. That's interesting. But, but yeah, that's the, one of the arguments against passing it was that it wasn't necessary because we already had federal law on the issue. Mm -hmm. Though it, it may, even if it's true that it's redundant to pass it, even if we have the federal law, um, if it's something that's already illegal, I don't see the point of opposing passing the law. Yeah. You know, well, also, too, I would think, what if that federal law is ever rescinded? Right. But if this is what you want in New Hampshire, then you need to have the law in place in case the federal law ever goes away. Yeah, but the whole the whole logic of the federal law doesn't make sense because how can you possibly send people to Massachusetts to do something that's federally prohibited? Right. That would seem to violate your mm, right. code of ethics and everything else. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But so. even, even if the law wasn't necessary because of federal law, I think things like this are a nice way of us showing what the state is about, mm -hmm. what our values are, you know, basically put the issue on record of what the state, <coughs> at least the government of New Hampshire is. And I, I know even people that are pro-abortion that are very much against um, partial birth abortions. So right. Like that. That's why those of us who are, actually I came up recently, those of us who are pro-choice, we don't like the term pro-abortion because it implies that we like to go out and encourage people to have abortions, which we don't. Fair enough. Sorry. <laughs> I'm used to offending them. Oh. I'll let you do I'm, I'm not easily I'm offended. <laughs> I'll let you do the labor one so you can read better than I can Ooh, anyway. Okay. What uh, else do we do on labor? Now, labor, we oh, had... Oh, I heard we, something today about right to work. Yes, that's true. Yes, it passed. The, uh, the, the right to work votes passed, but the key is... Oh, well, the key is is that it's not veto-proof. I don't believe any of the labor bills today were veto-proof. Um, so what will happen is the majority of them, if they make it through the Senate, the governor will then veto them. They'll come back to the House. And uh, it, what I was interested to see was not only did the people that originally opposed the right to work bill st stand with that, we picked up six additional votes today as far as I know. So, and uh, the other key thing is, is that the attendance today, this is all stuff that was published ahead of time. So um, if you had strong feelings about any of these issues, um, you'd have been there today. But with okay. that 90 or so people that were missing today, that shows me that the enthusiasm for this issue or I issues related to it is fading pretty fast. I think a, a lot of you see a lot of that. If if an issue um, fails the first term and mm -hmm. is brought sorry first year to term and for, in some capacities brought back the second time, a lot of times it, it does even worse the second time. Really? Because people yeah. say you know we've already talked about this and you know um, we've already done this, gone you know done there done that gone there done that. Let's 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 move on. Well, didn't somebody even say that? I thought I heard a soundbite on the radio today when I listened to the local news. Someone someone was uh, quoted as saying, "I don't know why we're bothering with right to work." I, I didn't catch the name of who it was, but someone in the legislature. Well, there's a there's a standing rule in the House that you can't. Um, if I if I try to introduce a bill to legalize handgun hunting for 
I mean, uh, hand, hand grenade, grenade hunting, hunting <laughs> for whitetail. Yes. Okay. Which I'm, I'm in favor of. I think so. Sounds yeah, I mean, messy. Mm, yeah. It'd be a good good sport. So so if we do whitetail hunting uh, with hand grenades in the first uh, half of the session or the, the first year, you can't, this house cannot bring, and it fails, the house cannot bring that same law back in. Okay. Okay. But they think they've either a changed rules or there's something I didn't actually realize till this year. Yeah, I was puzzling over that too. The I think that's a change in the rules because what they did, I think they changed the rules so that no, you cannot bring the same bat bill back unless it, it unless it was given a positive outcome from the house. So in other words, if it it passed the house and went to the Senate, and the Senate sits on it or mm -hmm or uh, the governor vetoes that you can still bring it in again. Okay. Because we've, we had uh, a right to work bill that's slightly different than last year, but just slightly. Yeah, the, the intent and the outcome would be pretty much the same. I, I think that's what the case was. If you introduce legislation and it fails in your branch, you know, in the House or in the Senate, yeah. you can't reintroduce it in the second year. But since it passed the House and the Senate, they could reintroduce oh, okay. it. Um, but expecting a different okay. outcome we're, with we're all gonna, the same people. We're going to pick up a phone. It's oh. actually, uh, it's Ross. Hi, Ross. How are you? Welcome to the show. Is this Matt? This is Matt. Matt, tell Mike McCarthy to leave the show right now if he will ever wants to have a future in politics. <laughs> It killed my political career. That's why I lost the election. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Ross. <laughs> As you can see, Ross is usually very supportive and uh, friendly. No, Ross is a really great guy. He's from here in Manchester. and uh, Yeah, he's been on the show a couple times, oh, yeah. actually. Yeah, so yeah. Now, if you if you only come on once, you're probably okay. But if you come on well, a couple times like no, Ross, no, then no, you're no. screwed. He's all right as long as nobody from Nashua sees it. Oh, see, right. See, the problem is Ross came on before his election for... What was he running for, school board or, or alderman or? Oh, I don't remember. I don't know. Chimney sweep. And, um, <laughs> Chim chimney? Chim chim <laughs> chim <laughs> chim chim it is a, a very important position, chimney sweep in city government. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So anyway, Ross was running for, for that, and we had a few other people running, and they came on the show that just before the election, and Ross lost, <laughs> and he blames being on the show, which I think is pretty good because that means that this show is watched that heavily. That's right. That's right. That's that, right. That people hate anybody associated. Yes. With it. And I think that's that's awesome. Because if people weren't watching the show, it couldn't have even a negative impact on it. Correct. Exactly. exactly. So exactly. That, I think all that's, publicity. That's quite publicity. a compliment. Yes. Yes. You know, if you're not hated, you're not doing anything. Exactly. Uh, that, would, that would explain why my campaign signs are driven over periodically during elections. I didn't so. do it that much. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, actually, it was a truck tire print. That yeah, makes yeah, sense. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What else is going on in the news? We did, so we did the labor bills. Yes, yes we now, did. Um, now, tell, tell the audience what happened to you. You, you were the, uh, I don't know what whip. You, probably you don't know what a whip is. In the, in the House... And in the Senate, they have, and you'll see see it on the national level too. They have majority whip or minority whip, and what that means is a person that is um, goes out and finds out how people are going to vote, so they have an idea of who's voting where and where where the numbers are. Mm -hmm. Is basically it. And you were at you were in the majority office working for Benton Court. Correct. And you had you were a majority whip number two or three or something. Four. Four, four. Mm -hmm. Majority whip number four. And tell them what happened when you voted against right to work. And uh... Well, it, of course, at that time, tempers were running high. I wasn't the least bit surprised that, that my vote on the issue, because I didn't vote with leadership, wasn't sure. well received. Sure. And I and a few other people were asked to resign from leadership. Uh, within a couple of days, everyone calmed down, and, you know, everyone's... I would say, for the most part, play nice again. Mm -hmm. But it's just one of those hot-button issues that, uh, unfortunately, like in Gary's case, he was the chairman of Fishing Game, which I have to say we very much miss you on Fishing Game as chairman or in any capacity. Is that funny thing we were talking about? We yeah. more funny. So yeah. <laughs> uh, You can imagine Fishing Game is pretty boring most of the time. Not, not as bad as, uh, what do you call it, uh, ways and means or something numbers-driven. Sure, but, sure. Uh, so, yeah, if, if, as a result, unfortunately, my name was popping up in the papers for at least a couple of weeks after that, as was yours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So some Republican-on-Republican Republican violence. Very, very <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> very amusing for Democrats. Uh, right, right, <laughs> of course. 
So it was great when you get your opposition to beat up on each other. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, you know, I think a lot of people, like I said, we picked up six votes on Right to Work today. Okay. A lot of people are, are seeing it for what it is. It's an issue that people have chased for more than 30 years in New Hampshire, had the same mm -hmm. outcome every time. Whether we had Republican majorities or Republican governors, it never seems to go anywhere. So I, I just couldn't see investing myself emotionally in the issue in expecting a positive outcome. Sure. But that's what the speaker did. I think he invested himself emotionally or, or started taking it personal because... Yeah, he tied too much of his career to things. I think probably there's biggest mistake. I think we went on Fox and said, I have the votes to get this passed. It will be passed. Oh, okay. and, and I remember watching on TV, you know, seeing the numbers, thinking, no, we don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's one of those things where... Uh, I, it, I mean, like, you know, Gary and I in the past, we, we've had minor disagreements here on different votes, and, and let's say we're on, on the same page 90% of the time, and sure. it, as, as most of us are up there. So you just got to focus on what you agree on and work on that and just uh, accept the fact that people aren't going to agree with you all the time. Right. And, and of course, don't take things personal. Don't take it personally. Right, right. right. And, you know, the only people you really have to make happy are your constituents. It's one of the lessons I was told early on by one of the, the guys who's kind of bringing me along when I first got there. He said, anyone gives you a hard time, say, you know, when you move to my district, then you can tell me what to do. Right. Other than that, no. There you go. Yeah. That we don't sense. answer to each other. Some people get this confused idea that we work for each other, like someone's a boss or something, but it's not the case. Right, right. Yeah, and I don't know what that is. I know that, uh, um, as, as I, you can attest to, when at the beginning of last year, what I told, uh, not not particularly to you, because you you've been there a while, but mm -hmm. mainly I was talking to the freshmen in the uh, committee as chairman. I said, you know, don't get too friendly or too close to the people at Fishing Game. Mm -hmm. You're not here to represent them, because that's what happens. I don't know if it's Stockholm syndrome or what it is, but what happens in the New Hampshire House is you'll have the the uh, people, um, um, like say on Fishing Game. They, the people from Fishing Game come and testify against their four bills, yeah. and they're always very friendly, and they'll have us over to the Fishing Game office and, you know, have us, we have cookies and sandwiches mm -hmm. and things like that, but they're basically lobbyists. Right. Okay? Yeah. And you've got to keep a certain amount of objectivity. You can't get too, so close that eventually... If you look at most of the committees in, in the New Hampshire legislature, and I don't think it's deliberate, I don't think there's ill intent, but um, um, you end up with uh, committees that are more representing the the uh, branch of the government they're they're there to oversee or to to pass laws for or against, mm. and they end up representing them instead of the people. Exactly. Yeah. The the problem you have is is that we're there to basically be the eyes and ears of the people right. and not, not advocates for the agencies. Now, nine times out of ten, we're going to be working off the same page, and that's fine. But occasionally we have to say, well, wait a minute, no, we don't want to do it, or we want to do it this way. And it, that, that was another thing that happened last term. It was a bill Gary and I were working on. The fishing game didn't much care for, and we had other representatives coming up and lecturing us, saying, well, you know, that agency isn't happy about it. I thought, well, wait a minute, we've got this reversed. Right. They work for us, not us for them. Right, you know? right. And, of course, we have to treat each other with mutual respect, but no, no, I, uh, I agree with you 100%. You'll see it in other things where basically the committee oversees the, the dealings of state agencies, and they have to act as the people's representative, not a representative or, or an extension of the agency. Right. And we, after a few years, people start ending up being a, an extension of the agency. Instead. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the really cool one I, we've had on, uh, on the show before is our Representative John Burt from Goffstown. Yes, yes. A delightful guy. I like John very much. <coughs> And um, he he he's on uh, uh, the county and municipal government or municipal government and county. I forget I'm what it is. Not one hundred percent sure. But uh, anyway, it's it's basically the the uh, committee that oversees um, legislation that will you know that is is uh, oversees town governments and city governments and things like that or pertains to those and. He had bump, uh, stickers made up for people, and a lot of people were wearing them around the house uh, that said 15 to Burt. Yeah. Because if you looked at the uh, committee reports, if, actually, you could probably find it quicker than me. Committee, a lot of the committee reports for the committee that John's on, they, they, uh, they were all coming back 15 to 1, 16 to 1, 15 to 1, because the people on there 
or uh, municipal and county. Is that what right? Is do, 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 I, oh, I can't find it. I think it's municipal and county. Yeah, the the um, the people that are on there are like selectmen, or they work for the selectmen, or they you know are are were selectmen, and they work for the towns, or they work for the uh, in the. Uh, or maybe they're they're aldermen or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So their loyalty is to town or city government. Okay. Okay. And so there's a conflict there because you, when you have the majority of the committee that's loyal to the the branches of government that they work in, they're not loyal to the people. Like for instance, yeah. uh, once that comes to mind specifically was uh, John wanted um, their the affiliations town towns have to be posted on their website like for instance some towns pay a great deal of money to belong to the uh, municipal county government association whatever it's called mm -hmm. and it's a lot of money yeah and the people should be able to know that their towns you know par you know paying this group right that lobbies the state house to protect the town organization yeah and is probably in direct conflict to the interests of the people. But there should be that transparency and that accountability. Exactly, and that's yeah. what John, and that was another 15 to 1 or 16 to 1 no against kidding. John Burt. Oh, yeah. Wow. And they're yeah. all like that. It's something that you do see quite a number, and I'm not saying it's a problem in all cases, but quite a number of our reps are also involved in city government. They are elected officials in the city. Yeah. So, you, like, like Gary said, you get into a question as to they have to make a decision, you know, what, where, what, what, what their priorities are. And like on the lobbying issue, I mean, conceivably, let's say the mayor decides to hire his cousin for eighty thousand dollars a year to be a lobbyist, you know, a setup job uh, yeah. that really doesn't do anything, right? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, just picks up a check. And again, I'm not saying anyone's doing that, but you have to guard against things like that. Yeah. yeah. So it, we we we're run into run into that situation a lot at the state house. If I were king of the forest, I'd mix it up and make people from <laughs> county and municipal government go on to health and human services for a while. Um, Let's see what else do we what else we got going on? Oh, I wanted to mention something that was in the national news. Mm -hmm. It was the uh, oh um, oh yeah. In the news this week is that guy who went out and shot about sixteen guy kids in Afghanistan, uh, men, women, and children. Yeah, yeah. And was it last week that we had a Lynn uh, Bl uh, Blankenbecker? Was that last? Oh week? yes, yeah, it was last week. Yes. <clears throat> I want when you're when you're out there judging this guy who went out and shot uh, these people, and I'm not saying that, that what he did was all right. It obviously isn't. Um, mm -hmm. Keep in mind the environment. Mm -hmm. Lynn last week, and I want to repeat this just so people understand, was talking, was, I was interviewing her about her uh, time in Afghanistan as a nurse, and she said that some of these Afghan people would take their children, push them in front of U.S. military vehicles and then collect the money from the United mm -hmm. States government. So our tax money would go to, to pay comp to compensate this person. Yeah. It's extortion, child, really. Extortion. Yeah. And then they would, they would uh, br the, this is how Lynn knew about it because they would bring the kid into uh, the hospital to get patched up and after they, they took the kid back, they'd, they'd shoot him. Mm. Yeah. So she, and when she first got there, had you know, became kind of emotionally attached to these little kids. They would come in injured, and and then after she realized that their life expectancy wasn't that good because they're now disfigured or mm -hmm. have problems, she had to kind of start, you know, part compartmentalizing. So there's a lot of crap going on there that would make even a normal person start tweaking. So, mm -hmm. so when we're passing judgment on this guy and how yeah. horrible it was, We've sent that guy over three different times over, to, I think it's three times. Yeah, I believe it was his fourth deployment, and I read someplace that he received a head injury in 2010. Yeah. Uh, my, my question with it is, is because obviously this is the act of a crazy person who's right. got a lot of problems. Right, I mean, no course. one does anything like this when they're in their right mind. But, yeah, you know, um, Gary brought it up on the walk over here today that we need to really have um, our military evaluating people more closely to say, all right, yeah. well, should we be putting this person in a combat situation? And if sometimes this can be the result. I'm saying you can forecast everything, but that person, obviously, it's a tragedy what happened there. Um, 
that person's life in addition is over. You know, mm -hmm. he's going to spend the rest, rest of his oh. life in prison oh, if he's course. lucky. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even if he hadn't done something exactly like this, that person's obviously a liability to everybody he serves with. Yeah. Who knows, maybe he's going to shoot up all the troops he's with or throw a hand grenade in the barracks or do something nuts like that. Right. Um, you know, it, it's like a flip side of the same coin of uh, what happened down at Fort Hood when that um, that major went on that shooting rampage mm -hmm. on the base. Yeah, but and he was a Muslim, so that was more of a... But he, he's obviously crazy too, but that was planned. It wasn't uh, just snap. But, my, but the thing is with him is he'd been exhibiting signs of unstable behavior for a very long time. Right. Okay, okay, and okay. again, for the sake of political correctness, nobody said anything. It went ignored. You know, yeah. It's not like he works in a yarn factory or something where you really can't hurt anybody. You know, you work with military equipment and guns. If you're not the most stable of characters, we probably shouldn't have you in that role. Right. I mean, there might be things you can do in the Defense Department that don't involve guns. You know, we can maybe push you off in the rubber gun squad and have you file paperwork or something. Yeah. But, yeah, that's... But, yeah, on, on Lynn's thing, she said that, you know, of the deployment she's been on, this is the worst she's ever seen. The conditions over there, the environment, it's terrible. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine what we put our kids through for, uh, I don't know. And for unfortunately... I'm not even sure anymore. Unfortunately, too, when something like this happens, people who hate the military then use this... They try to use this and propagandize it as, oh, see, see what our military does. Right. right. Our, our enemies and people at home who just don't oppose military. Right, exactly. Uh, and it's just like everything else. You know, when, when a priest does something wrong or a cop does something wrong, they, they malign the whole class right. of people. Right, and, absolutely. Uh, you know, of course, you've got hundreds of thousands of U.S. service people all on the up and up, no problems. Right. And they go to great lengths to protect civilians. you got one person who goes off the reservation and does something insane, then, of course, everybody's a bad guy. Right, so. right. Yeah, so, yeah, so, but anyway, so when you're sitting back here and it's uh, the worst part of your day is you get a flat tire, it's kind of uh, be careful before you judge somebody that's been over there four times. Exactly. I feel bad for he, his family, too. Oh, yeah. He's got, well, he's got two kids. He's got a wife and two kids. Yeah, it's terrible. Bad. Bad stuff. Um, oh, I wanted to touch on this, and this is kind of interesting, was uh, uh, Obamacare. When that was first introduced, a couple of weird things happened. When it was first introduced, it was going to cost $9 trillion over 10 years. Mm -hmm. No, $900, billion, 900 billion. billion. Yes. Yes. You had that many zeros, I would start losing track. Yeah. <laughs> so point, I, that's right, it was point nine trillion dollars. Okay. Um, today, the, uh, the uh, uh, what is the budget committee in uh, the, the... Budget estimate? Oversight Committee, is yeah, it? Yeah, in Congress came out with a $1.75 trillion cost. They've almost doubled what they believe that's going to cost today. I always say, anytime someone in government gives you a figure, add a few zeros. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying they're dishonest, just that they're terrible at math. So, yeah, um, yeah, they're definitely <laughs> terrible at math. Which is, yeah, I wish I had a calculator because do you remember when that was first introduced? It was introduced to cover, and I, I can't remember, it was 200,000 or 20,000, or it must be 200,000 uninsured people in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was something like that. Okay? So you've taken 200,000, let's <clears> call it 200,000 people. I can't do the math in my head. Do you got a calculator? Yeah, I have a calculator on my phone. Oh, good. So what's what's? Let's assume it was two hundred thousand. I can't remember that number. That number could be totally off base. Okay. So what's one point seven trillion dollars divided by two hundred thousand? Be surprised if your screen's big enough for all the zeros. <laughs> How many zeros is that? A trillion. It's a thousand billion, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be one point seven. Zero, zero. <laughs> One, jeez. More than we have. Well, <laughs> and then nine zeros after that, I think. Right? Nine zeros? Because a million is six. <laughs> a billion is nine. A trillion is obviously 12. So it would be one, seven... Now you see why eleven I, zeros. Eleven zeros. Okay. Right? There's, a, there's a reason I don't introduce myself as Mike McCarthy CPA because yeah. math is definitely. I can't do that many zeros on this. You can't. Yep, do I, it says out of range. Out of range. <laughs> yep. That's appropriate. That tells you something yeah, right there. Yes, it does. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's 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 get rid of. I don't have enough. Uh, I don't have enough bars for a trillion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The rest All of right. us don't either. <laughs> the new whatever the number turns out to be, it, it's a fine example. Only government could technically be buying in bulk 
and somehow spend more money than it would cost you individually to buy something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what was it, it was it like, like $10,000 toilet, toilets and stuff like that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you remember last, last term, the medical marijuana one? Yeah. It went, it went to the Senate from the House, and what it was is they were going to allow um, people to grow <clears throat> about three plants in their own house. Oh, okay. They had to have been seeing a doctor for about five years, so it wasn't something like you go see it like the, the crap that's going on in like Florida where they go see a doctor that's seen 10 yeah. minutes and then they're getting Oxycontin yeah, I mean, about, you know, around the corner. California, it's even easier. Ca well, that, that was Oxycontin. California's a pot. But yeah. anyway, so you had to see a doctor for about five years for a specific problems, glaucoma or cancer, whatever it right. is. And uh, then he could prescribe it, and then you could get a permit to grow it in your house, mm -hmm. and you were limited to how many you could grow. Sure. And I, I, I said okay. Yeah. I, I think I don't know if you voted for that or that was last term. So I don't believe I did. No. Okay. But anyway, then it went to the Senate, and it comes back, and the Senate said, "Well, we really want this to be run by UNH, and it's going to cost us." A quarter of a million dollars to set this up. Yeah, that's a lie. But anyway. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking. All right. First, you're gonna let a, a college kids grow pot. <laughs> well, I think that's they, that's one part. That's of, a fox garden then. Yeah. yeah. So so that, then you, the other variable is. But they have the expertise. Yeah, that's true. That is probably, true. Probably true. But the fact of the matter is, it's only the government that can figure out a way to lose money. Right. Growing pot. And introduce by introducing more bureaucracy yeah. into it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the pot the pot plantation concept cracked me up because initially they said two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, well, add at least one zero after that for the actual cost. Yeah, right. really. And then you've got this ongoing bureaucracy with its own costs, staffing. Yeah, yeah. And the head yep. of pot growing, and the then you need an executive director of pot growing. And <laughs> yes. The assistant to the assistant. And then, then, you'd then they have to pay for a lobbyist to keep this process going. Of course. And then they have to build all the, um, alongside the liquor stores on the highway, they have to have the medical marijuana store or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. But, um, no, the, the problem I, I, I had with it was uh, it, it, it just, you, you can pass this, tie up this money on this ongoing concern, okay? And now you have to go back to your district and explain to people why they still have potholes in their street or why this bridge isn't fixed. Right. Oh, well, where'd you spend the money, Mike? Oh, yeah, we opened a pot plantation. That's not good. Like I said, I like people with a sense of humor, but most people don't have a sense of humor like that. Right. They'll be like, "What? Well, why? <laughs> you know, right, yeah. I, I, I would like my money used to fix the pothole in front of my house or the bridge or the school or all the other things that we, we never have enough money for as it is. Right. So I hate the idea of hunting around for new places to tie up the people's money. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. All right, all right, try this. Um, <laughs> One point seven... And just do. Uh, Is it time for us to take off our shoes? Sh yeah, really. <laughs> oh, just uh, eliminate three zeros on each. So I don't think I can even do that many. Oh no way. No, I don't. I think I only got to like five zeros, and it said out of range. Well, let me try it. One point seven zero zero was six zeros after that, so eight zeros total. No, I can't do it. I can okay, do let's let's uh, subtract a couple more zeros. I can do up to one, two, three, four. I can do up to six zeros. Let's see how many is that. So that's. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. All right. Seven, one seven with six zeros. Okay, got it. We're Divided by two. simulating a committee hearing right now. Divided so this by is how two. Government Divided works. by two. Because okay. we have to eliminate those zeros on the 200,000. Okay. No, that can't be right. That gives us uh, 8,500,000. 8 million. F that's, the, that's the number I get when I do that. I get 85. <laughs> So that's Five eight million zero. dollars per person. Sounds that's like I'm, a bargain. <laughs> is, am I, is that correct? Because basically, the, the whole the whole national health care was was based on trying to make sure those two hundred thousand people were insured. Mm -hmm. And if what you're saying is correct, and I'm sure that can't be correct, but you're saying it's going to cost. We're doing this at an expense of one point what billion million dollars per person. Well, I've got eight. eight Eight million five hundred thousand. I don't think that's right. I think I think we're just not. Well, something's wrong, but no, I don't think it's that far off, though. No. If anybody's got a calculator <laughs> out there that can uh, divide uh, one point seven trillion by two hundred thousand, get the per person <laughs> cost. Cause that, yeah, that's what you know. Because I was hearing the stuff on the news, and, and I, I went I went back and. Uh, 
I remember there was only a couple hundred thousand people that mm -hmm. were actually there. There were the quote unquote uninsured. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's a lot of money per person. You know, you <laughs> could put them in a freaking bubble so they never get sick or die. Right. Right. You know, in <laughs> perpetuity for forever. But um, that's amazing. Only the government can figure a way to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's national health care. Guns. Guns. Always a fun topic. Um, get any new guns lately? <laughs> <laughs> no, what? No. Gary just likes saying guns. I just like saying sure. guns. <laughs> I have nothing to go with that. There's nothing. It's great. Like if you're on like a bus or train or just in a public place and start doing that, guns. People get nervous. <laughs> yes, they yes. Get very nervous. <laughs> You see, like, the pretty soon, you know how, like, buses can get crowded? You've got all the space you need to sit down. People just get away from you. Right. Um, or when Gary gets on a bus <clears throat> with a hand grenade. Yeah. You know, these are fun. And, and, and there's there's a, um, a catalog I saw when I was younger. It had all kinds of sketchy stuff in, that you could buy. And they actually had it. The with, glasses that you could see through girls' clothing and that stuff? No. no a little further no, along okay. than that. That has merit. Um, but, <laughs> no, it had, it had dummy hand grenades or training grenades that had uh, an option for active fuse assembly. So conceivably, you could load it up with black powder oh or something, God. and the thing would work. <laughs> now, here's the funny thing. It would say hand grenades on, on this page, and then uh, on the next uh, page, it would say hand grenade fuse. And on, like, on one, it would say hand grenades, completely harmless without fuse. Hand grenade fuse is completely oh, oh, Yeah. Wow. I'm oh. just, I immediately knew as I was reading this thing, I'm probably on a watch list now. Just for oh, yeah, yeah. Was well, this one of those survivalist magazines Kinda, or something? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, this isn't good. <laughs> yeah. The Soldier of Fort Misfortune or something? Uh, uh, no, no, it was it was, uh, it was a catalog company. You buy all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, that's but it, awesome. it was funny. No, on the gun thing, though, I was, I was talking to uh, our friend uh, Lee Quant today. He's recovering from uh, open heart surgery. Oh wow, the guy's tough as nails. Two weeks, he's already back. You know? Good for but, him. But uh, he's, he's not jumping around or anything. But he's sure. definitely in better shape than I would be. But so I said, "Oh, you're in a lot of pain." He says, "Yeah, I've been in a lot of pain." But to make myself feel better, I bought a new uh, what was it Rem Remington 700 <laughs> bolt action rifle. So I feel much better now. So. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually true. Some people with pain relief get addicted to drugs. He's definitely addicted to firearms because uh, he's got a lot of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got issues. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so you've been uh, you've been a state rep for this is your second term. My second term. Second yes. term. Okay. Because he he uh, Mike and I were on the uh, fishing game. Uh, that's how we got to know each other on fishing game. Correct. And um, what motivated you to run to begin with? Well, I moved up from Massachusetts. Uh, going to You're not supposed to admit that. Oh. He's know. like the third person to come on the show and say that, too. I know. Well, you no, it's think. a lot like, like AA. You get up and you say, hi, I'm Mike. I'm an alcoholic. Mm. Well, I'm, my, I'm Mike. I'm a recovering Massachusetts resident. Yes. Um, but, you know, I, I did the smart thing. I realized <laughs> I didn't fit in there, so I moved up here and, you know, had a great time. But, unfortunately, when I came over, I left the door open and too much Massachusetts crept in after me. Really? And, uh, you know. Over so it's your fault. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to atone for my sins. Uh, so it was one of those things where if I were just happy with the way the government was being run, I would just said, okay, I'll sit home and cou on the couch and ignore it. Sure. But we saw a lot of stuff come through in the, the last three terms where yep. just New Hampshire was eroding. And, you, and I, we saw a lot of it last year. Last now, term was real bad. But so many people would get up and they would say, well, we should pass this bill because this is how they do it in New York or New Jersey or Massachusetts. And, uh, yeah, I just find it insulting saying the people of New Hampshire need to change to be more like somebody else. You know? Right. I'm sure those are wonderful places and I'm sure they're fairly easy to get to. And if you want to live there, go ahead and do that. Right. You know? <laughs> but you don't see me like acting as like a traveling cultural missionary extolling the virtues of New Hampshire in New York or any place else. You know? Sure. Saying you need to change to be more like us. For No. So and it's been a lot of fun, too. Actually, I'll tell you, the key reason why I got involved is uh, my wife, Peggy. She uh, she said, I'm sick of watching you yell at the TV. Why don't you go do something? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> okay. You know, so here yeah, we are. Yeah, that's good. And yeah. I'm living proof anyone can get elected. So <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People vote for us. Hey, anyone else listening or watching, you got a great chance of getting elected to something. Yeah, Peggy, Pe your wife is delightful. She's on She's on uh, one of my Facebook friends. She's a funny lady. Really? Yes. Yeah. She's she wicked. She must be Irish. Oh, yes. Wicked Irish. Wicked Irish. But um, now... She's what, the brains of the outfit, so... <laughs> what are the, the, when you're yelling at the TV, what issues what you, would you typically be yelling at? Um, gun control issues, skyrocketing taxes, you know, nosy government getting involved in mm -hmm. people's lives, big brother nonsense, and eventually just find... And the funny thing, the thing I always laugh at with uh, government is we give them a set sort of parameter of responsibility. So this is your job. 
and they make a total mess of that, or they neglect it entirely, and they just cast around for new responsibilities to take on. Sure. <laughs> it, it, it's like if you hired a carpenter who's doing a lousy job at your house, and then he wanted to decorate. You know, like, no, look, could you, could you back to not right. messing up your carpentry job? Right. You know, that you're doing a lousy job at all these other things, so I don't really know that you're qualified to take on more responsibility <laughs> yet. Yeah. Now, you, you uh, when we were uh, on the way over here, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of a, uh, a lot of people in New Hampshire pretty understand the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say probably more so than most other states. It's we're it's, a heavily armed state, right? Yeah, I mean, it, well, heavily armed, but heavily armed is, is irrelevant if you don't understand why. Yeah, you know, if if you don't fundamentally understand why we have the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. that it's there specifically so that you could. Uh, it's twofold. One is to be able to protect yourself. But the other one is to be able to protect yourself against government. Mm -hmm. And people don't want, don't, uh, if you don't understand that, it's, it's, it's dangerous. And that's right. why you end up like people in Massachusetts not having hardly any rights to bear arm at all. Is, because it, is it restrictive there? Very, very, very restrictive. Very restrictive. Yeah. The hard part about Massachusetts is that you've got what the state laws are, but they can be applied arbitrarily in some cases, like oh. issuing pistol permits. So you can live in one town. And this actually happened to me. I moved from Malden to Medford. Like, I, on a nice day, I could walk from one place sure. to the other. Yeah. And um, when I went to renew my permit, they said, okay, well, we'll give you a, a target and hunting license, but we're not going to give you a carry permit. I said, well, why? Because we don't like to. We're just not. So sue us if you, if you don't like that. Wow. Other towns, someone moves into and they say, well, we're not going to give you a permit at all. You're going to have to sell all your guns or move out of town. No kidding. Yeah, that's, that's just crazy. Here in New Hampshire, that sort of thing just doesn't, is not allowed. Right, right. But what it is, well, I love the arguments that are made. It, it's like, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm protecting you from you because you're obviously such a danger to yourself. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> How is that not insulting? Right, you know? right, of course. I, but the same kind of reasoning, I'm, I'm, I imagine these people like saying, you know, they're nervous about people having guns. So, like, when you go into the Outback Steakhouse, do you say, oh, my God, these people all have knives. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they might stab me, you know. Now, some folks will say if you I don't go there so for that very reason. But you you got a gun, so you one up on them. So, you know. I just avoid sharp things because I'm clumsy. <laughs> well, I figure I could mention the gun because you got a hand grenade. So, you know, it's not like it's going to be a big surprise. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a trust issue to me. It's not really about liking or not liking guns, but it's about trust. Yeah. You know, like, I don't ride a motorcycle, and if I did, I'd probably wear a helmet. But if you don't want to wear a helmet on the motorcycle, that's your business, you know. I'm not going to get in there and tell you what, what you should or shouldn't right. be doing because you're an adult. But and allowing people to have guns in New Hampshire cl clearly works. I mean, I believe statistically yes. we're the first or second safest state in the country. That second. Well, second. second. I that messed it up by moving here. We would have been first. But yes. I oh, now, well. So. Oh, you ruined everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's why the... But I like to say we have lots of guns, but very few murderers lunatics. Yeah, so it's a yeah, good equation. Absolutely. And the weird thing is some of the most atrocious crimes are committed in the state committed by people with knives. I yeah. don't know why, but like that thing that happened over Mount Vernon, you know, complete atrocity, no guns. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 uh, probably someone who worked for uh, Outback. Yeah, yeah that's there you go. Is. Yeah. Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, access to knives. Baseball bats. So I, I, I think one of my favorite was the, uh, I think it was, um, um, all in the family, mm -hmm. and uh, Meathead comes running. In. Archie, Archie, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, you know, Joe down the street got shot and killed, and Archie says, "Would well, you rather he got thrown out a window?" Because <laughs> <laughs> that's actually what happened in Massachusetts. The, the year they passed that uh, one-year mandatory for uh, handgun, and the following year, the handgun deaths did go down. Mm -hmm. The deaths didn't go down. They just used baseball bats. Yep. Wow. You know, I, so it didn't it didn't change anything. Right. Just the distance you had to be away. Well, th there was a fellow I used to work with who had been an EMT in Queens, New York, a particularly rough section of that borough, uh, Jamaica Queens, where he grew up. And a lot of people would ask him, "Oh, wow, did you have a lot of people that were shot that you had to patch up and take to the hospital?" He says, "Almost no shootings. Lots of stabbings. Huh. Lots of bludgeonings." And he said, "What you'd see is groups of guys would walk around, four or five of them, with hockey sticks or baseball bats, because they knew the people that they'd be preying on can't have guns living in New York. Oh, okay. So they'd walk up, encourage you to give give you mon give them money over, and if you didn't have enough, they'd beat you up, mm -hmm. you know, or they'd beat you to death, or throw you in front of a train or something." Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, bad people will do bad things. Right. You know, good people do good things. Yeah, I know I had a, 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 a friend of mine from um, uh, Brooklyn, New York, 
and I was talking to him about that, and he said uh, the one-year mandatory, what that actually does, <clears throat> you know, practically speaking, means that somebody who is a drug dealer mm -hmm. and they have a pistol with them to protect their ounce of coke gets arrested, okay? They're, gonna, they're looking at uh, 20 years for the coke and a year mandatory for the, uh, the firearm violation. They plea bargain down to three years and they're out in two. Now you take a guy from the suburbs who's got a wife and two kids with him and he has a handgun to protect his family which is I think you know arguably a little bit more important than an ounce of coke mm -hmm. and somebody sees it something happens whatever falls out he gets caught he's got a year in jail he's gonna probably lose his house might lose his family mm -hmm. so he's lost everything yeah okay the coke so He's lost everything, and he spends a year in jail, whereas the coke guy is out in two. Yeah. And that's basically the, the fundamental reality of gun laws, you know, as to what actually, how they work. Well, when you apply them to private citizens who are not criminals, what you end up with is ruining somebody's life. You know, because some of these guys, other people, like we were talking about, like the uh, coke dealer, he's in and out of jail since he's a teenager. Right. So it's not really that big of an impact on him. This other guy, his chances of getting a job again, and all for really... Is, you know, in a lot of places, the issue really is shouldn't be whether you have a gun or a knife. It should be what you're doing when the police become aware of the fact that you have a gun or a exactly. knife. Exactly. And yes. I, I, I don't. And the, the, the other thing that I've become really conscious of, and I'm, I'm sure Gary agrees with this, is when we're looking at laws, people are writing, things are asking us to try to pass. I try to look at it in terms of how is this going to impact the relationship between the police and the average citizen? You know, is it going to put them at odds with each other? Mm. And, you know, cops have a very difficult job. So what you don't want to do is create situations where there's animosity between the non-criminal citizen right. and the police. You want them working together, you know. You want the, the people to be able to trust law sure. enforcement. And, you, don't want yeah. to say, you don't want to say, wow, you know, uh, the police are kind of out to get me even though I'm a criminal. That's, that's right. not something you want. Right. And, I, like, I figure both, both our, our state government and the police departments, they work best with the, the consent and cooperation of the citizens. So if, if we anger them, then, you know, by passing laws that put us at odds with them, then it really is counterproductive. Right. Now, we, get, we have a, a situation going on in D.C. We have uh, Barack Obama, who basically... Who? President Barack Obama, <laughs> who said... Um, he has an unusual name, so it's... Yes. It throws Hussein it. Obama. <laughs> so, who, um, I always call him Barry. You do? Yeah. So he'll buy when he's a teenager. Oh, yeah. nice. But anyway, he... Um, <laughs> He made the statement, I think he was talking about Pennsylvania. I forget who he was talking about. I remember, it was Pennsylvania. I remember this during he, the campaign. They, 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 they cling to their guns and their religion. Guns and Bibles. Yeah, I remember guns that. Guns and their Bibles. And if you're a Second Amendment person or understand the, the necessity to the right to bear arms, that should have been enough. Mm -hmm. Okay? You should have known everything you need to know about his understanding of the Constitution as it relates to guns from that one statement. It wasn't a misstatement. It was a direct statement about firearms. He backpedaled a little bit on it afterwards. Well, it was something, though. It wasn't something he was saying. It was something he was saying privately, I believe, in a meeting, in a campaign meeting, and someone recorded it or something. something so, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, it's I, still, I believe it's, it was like a, um, like a fundraiser. So he was playing to a safe group of people to say that yeah. to. And I'm sure he didn't intend for other people to hear it, but yeah. if it's what he's thinking and feeling, it's something the rest of us should hear. You know? Okay, right. so now you've got, you've got a uh, president of the United States who fundamentally has no regard for the Second Amendment. Politically, I think he does. Yeah, I don't think he's a threat. Well, that's just that's, the that's, Amendment. Not, that's where I disagree. It's okay. the second We're, term, Barack Obama. I'm really a little that's concerned what, about. But that's what Mike was saying was saying on the way over here. Yeah. Is what about the Second Amendment when he doesn't have to worry about being elected? He, but, mm. Well, I what I what I base my view of him on on gun control issues is where he kind of came up politically. Sure. Like the city of New York, uh, actually, the state of Illinois is the I believe the only state that doesn't issue carry permits uh, in the country. Uh, they're, they're like in New York, you can get them even. It's hard, but yeah. you can get them. But Illinois, it's not even a provision. Um, I didn't know that. And really. uh, in Chicago, they have 
astronomical murder rates. Yes. You know, I, I've always felt that if you're a criminal, you can get a hold of a controlled substance like, you know, Coke or heroin that isn't actually occurring in this country. Getting guns probably won't be a huge challenge for you. Right. So you've got all this crime running the streets out there. And uh, their, their worry mainly still is you, the private citizen, right. not the criminal. <laughs> um, but that's that's the environment where I would say, is, if not political views are shaped, you know, that's where he was uh, representing when he was a, a state senator and then later a U.S. senator. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just like you'd expect if either I were, uh, you know, running for Senate or presidency, you would already kind of know where we were coming from on guns, probably where we're from here in New Hampshire. Right. Where, uh, you know. Uh, but I, I think politically a lot of people are afraid of gun-related issues because some people say that's why um, um, Al Gore never became president. The the gun the gun bans under Clinton, uh, it really mobilized a lot of uh, the assault the assault weapons yeah. ban. Yeah, it did. Well, it actually did. It did the. Uh, um, I think it was um, oh Massachusetts. The guy just resigned because he they didn't like his new district and he didn't know anybody. Barney Frank. Barney Frank. Yeah. Barney Frank said and uh, he, he said um, after because it was the '94 election that absolutely swept. It was it was '92. Clinton came in, then you had Hillary Care, mm -hmm. and the assault weapons ban and something else. Um, the Bra the Brady Bill mm -hmm. all passed. Mm -hmm. Uh, except that Hillary Care didn't quite pass at that time. No. Um, oh, we have a call. Do we have time? Do you want to grab yeah, this? Yeah, sure. Or do want to? Okay. Hi, welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. Who's on the line? Yes, uh, this is for your guest. Um, I'd like to ask him a question. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what the law is in New Hampshire. Can you carry a loaded gun if it's you don't have a permit to uh, actually carry, but it has to be outside your body, like either strapped to your side, or like is a, a 38 up next to your uh, uh, shoulder area. So unconcealed. Uh, yeah, we call that yeah. we call that open carry, and that's something that's legal in New Hampshire. So you can openly carry a firearm, not concealed, and you don't need a permit for that. Just like you don't need now a permit. Can mm -hmm. it be loaded? Can it be, yes. Can the gun cap be empty? No, it does not. Okay, uh, now somebody was just telling me the other day, if you have, if you were driving in your car mm. and you had a gun, you, it couldn't be loaded, and it would have to be, say, on your seat or somewhere where the police officer or state trooper could actually see it, and it would have to be unloaded. Is that, is that true? Yes. Hmm. Now, why, what's the difference between that and carrying the gun on you and loaded? I believe it's it's an issue of, of like, it being under your personal control, would you say that's the issue, Gary? I'm not sure it's, it's personal control because theoretically you could have it uh, uh, have a shoulder harness with a gun hanging out. It's um, I don't I wasn't there when they they passed that, so I can't remember. I don't know what the arguments were in favor of it, but you are correct. So if, if, if the, the, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this: and If you were driving in the car and you had a shoulder harness. Or like on the side of you, and it was open. Could that gun be loaded no. then, as long as it's on you? Not once you're in like the car. Once you're in the car, that if you don't have a now, if you have a permit to carry, which is only ten bucks, okay. Well, right. But anyway, so if you don't have a permit to carry, and you have a handgun in the car, the ammo and the gun should be far enough apart so that it, it the firearm cannot easily be loaded. Now, far, what do you mean by far enough apart? In other words, <laughs> in other words, if you had a um, a pistol on the on the uh, front seat of your car, and the clip with the ammo next to it, that would be illegal. Now, if the so clip was in the like glove compartment, it's it's probably it, you're probably on safer ground. Is now, that? Wait a minute, aren't you hiding? Aren't you hiding ammo? Um, That's okay. You can hide all the ammo you want. Oh, you can. Yeah. Is that maybe because of a concern of, of the police? Because yeah, when, I, when they do a traffic stop, they don't want somebody to be able to pull a gun because they never know what they're walking into. No, but uh, and the other thing, too, is if somebody's got a pistol permit, they've already done a background check on them. They already know that they don't have any criminal records. So the probability 
that somebody's going to tweak out because a cop's giving them a speeding I, ticket. I still can't see the logic in it. Here's a person walking mm-hmm. down the street with a loaded gun. Mm-hmm. Right. What is the difference between that and being in the car? I just don't understand the logic to it. Well, I agree I mean, with you 100%. Um, I don't. It goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier about presumption of ill intent, just assuming yeah. that there's something wrong with the majority of people. Um, I personally am opposed to it. And another issue I think is poorly conceived in this bill, this gives me the impression that as the person gets in and out of their vehicle, they're loading and unloading their gun. <laughs> right. And the chances for mishap there, of you hurting yourself or accidentally discharging the gun, are through the roof. You know. So, yeah, I mean, guns that stay in their holsters, loaded or not, generally don't go off and right. don't cause problems right. for anybody. we gotta, we got to let you go, caller. Thank you. We're actually okay. nice. right. time to wrap Thank up. You very much. Thank Have you. A good, night. Good, good call. Thank you. So anyway, uh, that's something to be something. Uh, people, if you're in favor of the Second Amendment, you really mm-hmm. should think about for this next election. Barack Obama is not going to be restricted in um, or concerned with getting a third term, obviously. Right. So therefore, his um, lack of regard for the Second Amendment could could have great impact on mm-hmm. us in the next four years after the election. So yes, keep that in mind. As we've been telling a lot of people, whoever it is that you want to be voting for, and you know, whoever you're supporting in the primary, I've heard some people say, well, if it's not my guy, I'm not going to vote. You know, I'm just not going to vote at all. And I think that's a huge mistake. You yeah. Know? So if you don't vote against Barack Obama in 2012, a lot of us aren't going to want to hear you complaining about him in 2013. Yep. Yeah, see, I invited Mike on the show, even though he supported Romney and I supported Sam <laughs> Oh, you should be happy, Santorum. Uh, Santorum, Santorum did really good. Well. Did very well. Yes. He did very well yesterday. And yes. he is a champion of the Second Amendment. He is. Yeah. Last He's time good. I talked to him, he had just come from a. Um, he'd been like an honorary MC at a uh, NRA function, mm-hmm. and it was like a big thing where they had all kinds of displays. And I said, "Oh, did you get to look anything?" No, they ruined my day. They dragged me out of that place and made me go campaigning. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> anyway, I think we got to wrap it up, um, Mike. Representative the Honorable Mike McCarthy, you have a good evening, and thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks very, for inviting me. Very nice I had to meet a great you, time. Mike. And uh, it's Matt, right? Matt, <laughs> yes. We'll oh, see you next week. I like getting, you. You're getting good at this. I like you too, Gary. You're all right. All right, have a good night, folks. <laughs> nice thank to you. meet you, Matt. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs>